It's a thrill to be here and an honor. I'm trying to get to know each one of you by eye contact before we start. Uh, it's going okay. I think I've seen each of you in the eyes pretty much. Okay, shall we start with a poem? Let's start with a poem. Uh, one should always be drunk. That's all that matters. That's our one imperative need. So as not to feel time's horrible burden that breaks your shoulders and bows you down, you must get drunk without ceasing. But what with? With wine, with poetry, or with virtue as you choose, but get drunk. And if at some point on the steps of a palace, in the green get grass of a ditch, in the bleak solitude of your room, you are waking up when drunkenness has already abated, ask the wind, the wave, a star, the clock, all that which flees, all that which groans, all that which rolls, all that which sings, all that which speaks, ask them what time it is, and the wind, the wave, the star, the bird, the clock will reply. It is time to get drunk so that you may not be the martyred slaves of time. Get drunk, get drunk and never pause for rest with wine, with poetry, or with virtue as you choose. Now that's a liberal poem, but I'm getting ahead of the story. A few years ago with colleagues, I tested whether people, human beings, will pay or demand payment to be able to be choosers and thus to have personal agency. We conducted an experiment with several trials. As the participants in the experiment worked, they had a choice whether to exercise their own judgment or to delegate the judgment to a trusted advisor. They learned in real time that the advisor was really good at choosing, better than they were. And the question was, do you choose for yourself or do you rely on the trusted advisor? The central finding was simple. People will forego money to control their own payoffs. Control and personal agency have value. As a result, people earned a lot less than they would have if they delegated to the advisor. The advisor was better. Still, they insisted on choice. People knew, importantly, that the delegate was better than they were, and yet they insisted on making the choice. This finding of an agency premium, let's call it, is consistent with numerous studies from multiple nations. John Maynard Keynes thought ideas move history. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is moved by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. In recent years, a lot of people have been really upset about what they call liberalism. I'm going to be focusing on attacks from both the right and the left, though the attacks from the right will have pride of place. They have had a lot of salience in the current era. They overlap often with what the left says. The emphasis is often on what liberalism has done or made possible or impossible in the world. These are causal claims about what liberalism has achieved. Bad things. It's clearly implicit and sometimes explicit that liberalism is bad and that it should be rejected on principle. Are there liberal poets? John Stuart Mill, who loved Shelley, thought so. Although a philosopher cannot make himself, in the peculiar sense in which we now use the term, a poet, unless he have that peculiarity of nature 
which would probably have made poetry his earlier pursuit. A poet may always, by culture, make himself a philosopher. The poem you heard was from Charles Baudelaire, a contemporary of Mill, who wrote prose poems basically contemporaneously when, uh, with Mill's work, including his work on liberalism. The poem, Get Drunk, let's use the English version, is not really about alcohol. Did you notice? It's not not about alcohol, but it's not fundamentally about alcohol. It's a celebration of freedom. It is profoundly anti-authoritarian. Getting drunk and refusing to be a martyred slave of time is not a transgression, an offense, or a violation of anything. It's a right, but it's not just that. It's an imperative need. You might object at this point, if you're following me, that the poem isn't all that liberal after all, because of what it seems to make a green light is actually a kind of mandate. Oh my gosh, liberals don't love those. One must always be drunk, says Baudelaire. But it's a poem, not a treatise, and a license would be far too grudging and qualified and a lot less fun. One may drink, wouldn't have the right valence. Note well, this is not an es a poem about or an essay on tolerance. It asks you to act, not to tolerate. It's about your attitude toward yourself, not your attitude toward others. Well, okay, maybe it's also about your attitude toward others, but if so, it's not about tolerance. It's about respect. The poem is liberal in its recognition, at once mischievous and celebratory, of the diversity of preferences and tastes, of what gets one drunks. For some, wine is best. For others, poetry. For others, virtue. For many, all three. The power of the poem comes from the shocking oddity of the juxtaposition. It's a bit shocking, but not really interesting for a poet to celebrate getting drunk. It's a lot more interesting and a lot more liberal for a poet to link the three and to see them all as sources of inebriation. Part of the fun and the moral clarity of the poem comes from its, its insistence that poetry and virtue can get you drunk too. I hope some of you are thinking and may be willing to insist, I hope, since I know you all from eye contact, I can see some of you are, with Mill and many other liberals, that some pleasures are higher than others and that those of poetry and virtue are higher than those of wine. Even if that's true and important, and shh, it is, let's not say it that loudly or that often or with too much earnestness or with condemnation of the lower pleasures. Please, let's not do that. Liberals insist on accepting divergent conceptions of the good. Most of all, get drunk is quintessentially liberal in its insistence on human agency and activity rather than passivity, as you choose. Different people can exercise their agency in different ways. If you choose to get drunk on good works, great. And of course, the listed options are merely illustrative. The reader is invited to ask, what exactly gets me drunk? That is an excellent question to ask. Please do. Mill himself was insistent on agency as well. In speaking of happiness, the great liberal Mill urged that we mean not a life of rapture, but moments of such in an existence made up of few and transitory pains and various pleasures. Baudelaire was speaking of a life of rapture, but he was a poet, and maybe he didn't entirely mean it. The poem is liberal in its exuberance, its pleasure in its own edginess, its defiance, its rebelliousness, its implicit laughter, its love of life. It is the opposite of dutiful. It is far more exuberant than Mill's on liberty, but it is exuberant in exactly the same way. It celebrates activity and joy. Baudelaire found a way to combine the two without the slightest sentimentality. It is not desiccated and lifeless. It is fun, it's funny, 
it exemplifies what it celebrates. Here is William Blake on John Milton. The reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God and at liberty when of devils and hell is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. That's Blake on the greatest religious poem, I think, in the English language. Baudelaire was not of the devil's party and Milton wasn't either, but Baudelaire was a true poet and he knew something about hell. Liberals tend to know about that. Okay, so we shift gears a little bit, got a little more, less poetic, a little more political theoretical, with your permission, would you indulge? On the left, liberalism, or more specifically neoliberalism, is said to be old and dead and boring and dull and exhausted and to be nodding over through fatigue. Some people on the left hold it responsible for poverty, climate change, inequality, racism, sexism, the demise of labor unions, the rise of monopolies, Facebook, the uh, artist formerly named as known as Facebook, Meta, okay, technocracy, and a general sense of alienation and disempowerment. On the right, liberalism is said to have ruined everything. It is allegedly responsible for so much that is bad, repudiation of traditions, out of wedlock childbirth, increased reliance on technocracy, the bane of both left and right, environmental degradation, sexual promiscuity, a diminution of civic virtue, political correctness on university campuses, and a widespread sense of alienation. In coming to terms with these uh, objections, we have to put liberalism in quotation mark, it's because the set of ideas under attack isn't always specified. Any list of liberal thinkers includes Hayek, Isaiah Berlin, John Rawls, Martha Nussbaum, Ronald Dworkin, Christine Korsgaard, and Jeremy Waldron, and they are different from one another. Walt Whitman and Bob Dylan should be counted as liberals as well. Here's Whitman, sounding a lot like Baudelaire, only more saccharine. Do anything, but let it produce joy. Here's Dylan, sounding a lot like Baudelaire, only more edgy. Everybody must get stoned. There are causal claims here about what liberalism has done, brought about, or ruined. A much discussed example is Patrick Deneen, who holds respons liberalism responsible for globalization, deregulation, and titanic economic inequalities. Deneen and others who are unfriendly to liberalism on normative grounds have been making arguments about its terrible social effects. I do not believe these causal claims are justified. Liberalism is a set of ideas, not a person. It's not an agent in the world. But in a sense, I am leading with my chin here because I'm suggesting that liberalism places a premium on individual agency. And by pointing to Baudelaire and the suggestion, get drunk, we might think if that's what liberalism advises, liberalism is indeed associated with an assortment of social harms. So I'm making a little bow in the direction of the right, objection from the right here, but it's a little bow for reasons we're about to get to. Some people seek to provide a vivid narrative about the West from the 1940s to the present in which enlightenment liberalism or the enlightenment or something has been triumphing over something better, traditionalism and nationalism. In the process, rationalism and liberalism the tale goes, have been crushing conservatism and religion. The right result is a revolution which, in the view of some, will end in the destruction of the Western democracies. The apocalyptic nature of the tone, have you heard it before? It's all round, is not atypical of those who speak of liberalism as a baleful historical force, though for some writers, a large-scale collapse even a kind of apocalypse seems welcome, maybe even thrilling. To come to terms with this, let's talk about three things, shall we, that are emphasized by liberalism's critics and said to be things liberalism deplores. Tradition, constraint, and honor. I'm gonna say a few words about each of those things. Tradition is entitled to pride of place. According to Yoram Hazoni, one anti-liberal, 
a uh, prominent anti-liberal, quote, liberalism has proved itself either unwilling or unable to successfully defend almost any, his italics, almost any inherited political ideals or norms, no matter how beneficial or useful they may be, once a focused attack has been on them. We have witnessed, he says, the serial destruction of all inherited concepts. It's not baffling to understand where this idea comes from, especially if we keep the liberal focus on agency in view. Still, in liberal theory and liberal practice, countless inherited concepts are alive and well. Here are a few. Republican self-government, checks and balances, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, due process of law, equal protection, and private property. Liberals are fully able to defend inherited political ideals and norms. That's what they often do. To be sure, they don't think it's adequate to say that an ideal has been in place for a long time, but liberals agree that if an ideal has longevity on its side, there might be a lot to say in its favor. Hayek and Burke, not normally characterized as liberals, offered enlightenment-ish arguments on behalf of tradition, and liberals often embrace their claims. It is a point for liberalism, not against it, that inherited ideals and norms have to be scrutinized. Second, it is often complained that societies need not only freedom, but also constraints. Take that, Baudelaire. It's certainly true, but why, what kinds of constraints? Is it right to suggest that the famous capacity for self-constraint has been disappearing? If you focus on the poem, you might think so, but it's a poem. To come to terms with the question, we need to ask constraints, self-constraints with respect to what? In important places, there appear to be increases in self-constraint, more here than 50 years ago, and liberals of various kinds have supported them as candidates consider sexual violence, lynching, physical abuse of children, sexual harassment, smoking, drinking, littering, spitting, and anti-Semitism. All of these are more constrained in important places than they were in the 1940s. We can see self-constraint as disappearing only if we focus circularly on specific areas of life in which it has disappeared but it would take a ton of work and some kind of metric to establish that there's less self-constraint now than there was in, say, 1943. Because this point seems, I think, hard to dispute, we might conclude that the anti-liberal objection is not to the weakening of constraints in general, but in the weakening of specific kinds of constraints. Perhaps the real claim is about the weakening of constraints in identifiable areas. Sex and marriage are possible examples. But to know whether constraints are disappearing in those areas, we need data. And the evidence strongly suggests that at least in some recent places, in the domain of sex, constraints are growing, growing, not loosening. According to some reports, there is a kind of sex recession. Is liberalism responsible for that? No, rhetorical question. Um, it is true that people need constraints as well as freedom. Liberals famously call for prohibitions on harm to others. Liberals also emphasize pre-commitment strategies of various kinds as part of liberal political orders and individual life. Many examples invoked by critics of liberalism of the need for constraints fit easily within standard liberal accounts of freedom and coercion. Third, I think this is the most interesting of the three, though I'm going to be very brief and a little um, uh, severe on the concern. Some anti-liberals point to the importance of honor, and they object that liberalism dishonors honor. But it's hard to defend the proposition voiced by some anti-liberals that honor has largely disappeared because it violates the Enlightenment sense that all must be regarded as equals. You got the objection? All are equal, so what, what's, what's the good of honor? Can't honor people. 
That proposition's hard to defend in the United States. Forgive me for my parochialism, consistent with my barbaric accent. The term, the greatest generation, was coined in 1998 by a liberal, and it was used to honor those who fought and won World War II. Churchill is everywhere in your country and in mine. Churchill is honored by liberals. The term the greatest generation has become common, a matter of ordinary language, and hooray for that. You can believe that all human beings have equal dignity while also honoring Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Margaret Thatcher, Winston Churchill, and all those who fought for or fight for freedom. There's no inconsistency there. Sure, liberals have to have an account of honor, and they do. In brief, the liberal account of honor has a great deal with the exercise of personal agency. Liberals need not, and I hope they don't, disagree with Burke's famous words, we are afraid to put men to live and trade each on his own private stock of reason because we suspect that this stock in each man is small and that the individuals would do better to avail themselves of the general bank and capital of nations and of ages. Many liberals are keenly aware that there are terrific reasons for that form of Burkeanism. If a practice has stood the test of time, it might well be contributing to important social goals, even if we don't see that. If many people have endorsed a practice, we have epistemic reason to think that it makes sense. But with respect to a long-standing practice, it is always fair and often good to ask why. I've been playing defense for a little while, and now I want to go on offense. Here are some words for, from Abraham Lincoln speaking of slavery. What I do say is that no one is good enough to govern another without that other's consent. I say this is the leading principle, the sheet anchor of republicanism. Republicanism in Lincoln's formulation is emphatically liberal and its core is that sheet anchor an insistence on respect for individual agency, which is a product of the commitment to individual dignity. The sheet anchor explains not only the anti-slavery movement, but also modern civil rights movements, including the movements for race and sex equality. Mill's subjection of women can be seen as an elaboration of Lincoln's claim, and the same is true of McKinnon's sexual harassment of working women. Ruth Bader Ginsburg said at one point, I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask for our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. That's a liberal plea. Anti-liberals come in many shapes and sizes. They may or may not embrace the idea of individual dignity, but they tend to be a lot less enthusiastic about the idea of individual agency. Liberals ask with humility, but also with firmness, Authority, which authority? Traditions, which traditions? Of course it's true that the idea of respect for individual agency needs qualifications. There are harm to others, there are pre-commitment strategy, there are social norms, there is a liberal account of coercion. It begins with this question, where's the market failure? That is not the only question, but it's a good one. Okay, let's step back. That was a near cough, not a tear. <coughs> we may get to a tear. I don't expect so, but that was a near cough. Baudelaire's poem captures something essential about the most appealing forms of liberalism, its insistence on choice, the diversity of tastes and preferences, human agency, and the need for a kind of human exuberance. There may be, and probably, in proximity to the word exuberance, Kantian foundations for this, a belief that people should be treated as ends, not means. There may be utilitarian or welfare foundations noticing that each of us has access to something about ourselves that probably no one else has. The liberal insistence on agency appeals, I'm suggesting, to someone, something deep in the human spirit. That's why it ought not to be deemed tired or old or desiccated. It's the opposite. But it also aims to create something, 
a taste for that agency and an insistence that it is a blessing and a gift, not just a recognition, but also a creation of agency. Okay. You want to hear the most beautiful words of poetry in the English language? Don't say no. Addressing the plight of humanity after the fall, John Milton, blind, wrote with infinite gentleness words that I hope you will hear as if they were new. This is Milton writing of Adam and Eve after the fall, vulnerable and mortal and brave. Mill, by the way, was a liberal. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest and providence their guide. They hand in hand with wandering steps and slow through Eden took their solitary way. That's, Mel, uh, that's Milton on humanity. I'm going to dare to say, here are some lines that echo. That's not the dare. That's going to be self-evident. But stand with Milton's. They're the last lines of Possession by A.S. Byatt. If you haven't read Possession, please do, like tomorrow. And these are th close to the last words of the book, after a choice and the start of a romance. In the morning, the whole world had a strange new smell. It was the smell of the aftermath, a green smell, a smell of shredded leaves and oozing resin, of crushed wood and splashed sap, a tart smell, which bore some relation to the smell of bitten apples. It was the smell of death and destruction, and it smelled fresh and lively and hopeful. Liberalism has a smell, and that's it. It is green and tart, it is fresh and lively, it is full of hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sunstein, for those fascinating opening um, remarks. A few questions for me on both the talk and then um, a few other matters, then we'll open up to questions from our, I'm sure, far more learned audience. Um, my first question is, obviously you attribute the fact that there has been a um, large rise in the criticism of liberalism from both the left and the right. Do you think that there are easily identifiable reasons for this and do you think that increased economic dissatisfaction and changing economic factors like cyclical unemployment are to blame for this? It's a great question. So um, there are things that are broken um, and you can take your pick as, on what you would characterize as broken. Uh, if you think that part of the brokenness is widespread inequality and, and poverty, it wouldn't be random to say there's an account of liberalism that's not disconnected from that. I'm phrasing it more cautiously than the anti-liberals would. Or if you think that uh, getting drunk understood in some literal sense is responsible for um, behavior that is destructive to self and others, then it's not random to associate it with liberalism. So I, th I think the, the causal account is if we see bad things, we can maybe associate them with parts of a theory of something, that we connect with that. And you may have noticed the oddity that I, um, Burke is a hero of mine, Hayek too. Hayek was with Burke on traditions and uh, a quintessential liberal, Hayek. Burke is not ordinarily so described. Uh, but I think the, the mechanisms are what's responsible for something that's terrible. And if there's a, a prevailing something, I'm not going to say orthodoxy, but if there's a prevailing something, maybe it is causally associated with those things. 
Now, on an alternative view, th those things are a defiance of liberalism properly conceived. And the idea is liberalism isn't to be found from some shelf. We're all maybe making it or making something else. But if what we're making is liberalism, it's not, you know, Mill said this, therefore let's do it. It's something we, we figure out. There's another argument, I suppose, related to that, that is that it isn't really economic dissatisfaction that, that, that results in changing opinions, but rather a change in the sense people have of satisfaction in their life, um, a lack of feeling part of something, a lack of um, community, for, for, for lack of a better word. Um, do you think that liberalism's focus on individualism precludes the possibility of any form of communitarian framework um, or emphasis on the importance of community and involvement? Well, um, I'm thinking that I've only spent a few hours here and you seem to have a, correct me if I'm wrong, a community here, yes? And uh, like you know a lot of people and there's some connections you have with them, partly because you like them, partly because they're your part of your, yes, something like that. And um, uh, part of my time I spend in a place called Concord in Massachusetts, which is really a community and I live it. And uh, is liberalism causing problems for its community-ness? Um, I mean, if people want to be hermits, go for it. But if they want to be in communities, as people typically do, then liberalism is enthusiastic about that. So the idea that um, there are different ways to live a good life and that there's a diversity of good lives is compatible with an insistence that community is uh, regularly a part of that. So the, the, there are philosophical issues. So Michael Sandel had a book a number of years ago, which is often seen as a communitarian attack on liberalism. And uh, Rawls's answer was liberalism is political, not metaphysical. It's not a theory of uh, human nature. It's a theory of political ordering. And if there's a community 50 miles, miles, what is, he, what is a mile? 50 kilograms from here. If the, 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 that was terrible. <laughs> uh, this is my fifth talk of the day. If there's a community far from here, but not that far from here, uh, where um, people are uh, associating in ways that are different or more bound or less bound than here, liberals are, are good with that. So the basic idea is the incongruity between liberal political theory and communities is, I think, hard to explain, except the thought, if the thought is that communities work only when people can question their participation in them, that the freedom of action is what communities deny, and that's positive in some way. I think it's po positive in really small ways and negative in big ways. One final question on liberalism. I'm, I'm aware I want to get as many questions from the audience as possible. Um, as a politics student, I hear the phrase liberal democracy an awful lot. Um, and increasingly with leaders like Viktor Orban, the phrase illiberal democracy is his stated aim for what he wants Hungary to be. Do you believe that democracy is necessarily liberal? Um, what would an illiberal democracy look like? It's a great question. I actually read on the plane coming over a book by Raymond Goyce, a Princeton philosopher, called something like How Not to Be a Liberal, which is, is connected and he has some things to say about this. Um, uh, you could have a democracy which didn't respect individual agency in the way that liberals do and that didn't respect freedom of speech, that was committed to a particular religion. You could have um, a democracy that imposes or is fine with certain conceptions of the role of men and women. 
So it, democracy, if we understand it as majority rule, can easily be illiberal. The question is whether democracy rightly understood has a, a kind of um, implicit morality which would make it liberal. But I think that's a, a normative argument about the implicit morality of democracy rightly conceived rather than an objection to the notion you can have a self-governing people which isn't liberal because the majority isn't liberal. Would, a, would you consider a paternalistic democracy to be illiberal? Or paternalistic actions taken by a democratic government? Well, if, if the democracy is telling you you have to buckle your seatbelts, as the taxis here I notice do, that's paternalistic. I don't think, there's nothing in liberalism that is uh, determined to, to prevent people, uh, to prevent governments from requiring seatbelt buckling. So there are some forms of paternalism that uh, are, in my view, consistent with liberal respect for agency. So we wouldn't say, we wouldn't take Baudelaire too literally. If, if the idea is you get to uh, you know, take as many of a prescription medicine as you want to, because you think the more the, more the merrier, even when that's going to hurt you badly. It wouldn't be, in my view, illiberal to say that the law can stop that. So there's a, a liberal account of paternalism which would explore whether there's, people are being treated as objects rather than subjects, and that would be the Kantian side, and then there would be a utilitarian slash liberal account which would authorize certain forms of paternalism. I partly ask that question because obviously political liberalism has changed a lot over the last 150 years um, and countries, states that we sort of commonly view as being sort of paramount liberal democracies um, are starting to implement what I would see as being paternalistic laws. For example, New Zealand is implementing a law to ban the sale of cigarettes. Do you think that this represents a fundamental shift in the nature of liberalism or just a misnomer between what we're calling liberal democracies and what actually is happening. Okay, so my guess is if you looked at New Zealand X number of years ago, they were doing a bunch of paternalistic things they're not now doing. So the idea of the drift of liberal democracies is toward more paternalism would require an empirical demonstration. And I, my, my guess is there are many domains with respect to um, uh, uh, freedom where paternalism has been lifted in uh, democracies. The idea that health and safety judgments sometimes err, either because of a lack of information or because of a behavioral bias, is something that some nations are drawn to. And that's, um, in my view, that there's a serious discussion to be had. So if you impose taxes on cigarettes that are higher now than they were before, and if the reason is to prevent internalities, meaning harms people do to their future selves, that's an admissible argument within liberalism. Mill wasn't too excited about it himself, but his example of someone who's about to fall over a bridge, what the limits of that argument are is something which liberals don't agree about. Moving on with one final question before I open the questions to the floor, um, a more uh, broader question about uh, law and justice, and I'm sure one that you've had quite a lot in the last few weeks, um, about the role of the judiciary within politics. Um, obviously, in the United States, the Supreme Court holds an awful lot of power in policy making. Um, in the United Kingdom, not quite so much. Do you believe that there is a role for sort of activism uh, ju um, judges? Um, and what do you think the consequences of this are, both philosophically and politically? Okay, so the word activist judges is um, uh, ambiguous. So here's one conception of an activist judge, a judge who doesn't follow precedent. And yes, there's room for that. If you have abominable precedents, there's room for abandoning precedents. On 
another view, an activist is one, and I think that maybe this is what you mean, who strikes down the acts of the democratic branches. Now we have to distinguish, I think, between the idea that something done by a ministry is inconsistent with law. I think that that's not objectionable. So if the environmental authorities do something that parliament hasn't authorized them to do, if I wouldn't, I hope activists in a pejorative sense wouldn't be used, though sometimes do. Um, if what you mean is there room for judges striking down laws, that's something that many nations have. And it's if in Germany there's something that violates freedom of speech, the courts will strike it down. That I think that's not lamentable. Is it for all times and places a judiciary with the power of judicial review is a wonderful thing? No. If, if the judges are incompetent or evil or something, then you wouldn't want that. And if the democratic process is uh, really well functioning, the need for judicial. So it's a, a contingent um, practice and it could be contingently really uh, essential or it could be contentiously, um, it could be contingently very worrisome. One sort of follow-up to that. The United States Constitution and the role that the Supreme Court plays within that, do you believe that this acts to promote or constrain liberalism in America? Well, it would depend on whether what the judges are doing is illiberal. So if the judges are protecting freedom of speech, then it's promoting liberalism. If the judges are mandating violations of freedom of religion, that would be illiberal. I think, by and large, the United States Supreme Court has promoted liberal goals. And it, though the Supreme Court has sometimes tolerated illiberal legislation, it's not easy to think of a lot of cases in which the court has promoted illiberal outcomes. The issue of abortion is greatly contested. And whether if the, if the court overrules Roe against Wade, it wouldn't be at that point mandating restrictions on abortion, it would be permitting them. So it wouldn't be doing what some would consider, not by any means all, an illiberal thing. It would be authorizing what some, but not all, would consider an illiberal thing. Right, I will hand over to you guys now. Um, please, if you have any questions, raise your membership card or your hand, and one of our fantastic staff will come and bring you a microphone. Please stand up and ask your question. The gentleman in the front row. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I was curious about the poem. It talks about you know, a celebration of drunkenness, but drunkenness to, can take your rational functioning, like your executive functioning offline. You tend to get immersed. It kind of celebrates someone who's no longer fully rational, but kind of chose to no longer make themselves fully rational. And so extending that to the conversation about paternalism, um, there's one you know, approach which says, it's liberalism if, you know, as long as someone freely chooses to, you know, accept the future consequences of their action to, you know, become drunk, take off their system offline. And then others think it's more important that we preserve that, um, that, you know, there are these kind of soft forms of paternalism that's important to preserve freedom. And so I guess my question is, how do you draw that line between permissible and impermissible forms of, of paternalism? And how do you kind of see that liberal model of informing that view of what is acceptable paternalism? Okay, great. Thank you. So, so if we think of Baudelaire's poem as really about alcohol, I'm going to like it a lot less than thinking about it as things that give you a sense of, and then you can fill in the blank as you choose. It might be a walk in the park. It might be a relationship with someone you love. It might be learning about behavioral economics. That's what it is for most of us. Yes. Um, in drunkenness in particular, I'm not an enthusiast, I confess, um, partly for the reason you give. Sorry, Baudelaire. Uh, I, like, I like your choice of metaphor, but I don't like the literal understanding. Um, now, if people are getting drunk on a Saturday night and not harming anybody, including themselves, 
stand with Baudelaire. If they're getting drunk and driving, what I'm about to say now is extremely pedestrian, so I think I'm not going to finish the sentence. Right. <laughs> if they're driving drunk or if they're getting into fistfights with people, for reasons connected with you say they're losing their rational faculties, if they're treating other people as uh, enemies or um, something, then, then there's a part. Then Houston, we have a problem. Also, if they're harming themselves, we have a problem. And what we're going to do about that problem is a nice question for liberalism, related to the paternalism question. So, on literal getting drunk, there's a lot to say. Uh, the New Zealand anti-smoking initiative is that um, illiberal. Well, Robert Gooden, a great liberal thinker, wrote a book maybe 25 years ago called No Smoking, which offered a liberal argument against smoking, in fact, on prohibition of smoking, which is formally parallel to some of the arguments, let's say, for aggressive measures against drunkenness. So it's a great question. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Uh, the member in the front row with the face mask on. Thank you so much. I have a not so great question to ask. Um, my question is, uh, I understand you are you know, eminent in the field of behavioral economics. I'm wondering how do you apply that to sort of policy making and how does it ultimately address the imbalance between sort of structure and agency? Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, great. Thank you, and thank you for the nice words. Um, so uh, let's say there's a problem of uh, smoking or drinking. Um, how should we understand that problem? If it's that people don't know about the negative consequences of smoking or drinking, then to give them the requisite information is, I think, an uncontroversially liberal intervention that behavioral economists, like other economists, are comfortable with. If you think that the problem of smoking has something to do with present bias, focus on today, tomorrow's later land, a foreign country, we're not sure we're ever going to visit, um, then it's not a lack of information, it's a uh, treating your future self as unimportant. And the behavioral ec 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 economists are alert to that possibility. Or people might suffer from unrealistic optimism. So there's data suggesting that smokers are um, aware of the statistical risks of, of smoking, but uh, optimistic about their own risks, even though they're smokers. So if people are present biased or unrealistically optimistic, the behavioral uh, question, what are we going to do about that, is on the table. Now, a behavioral response might be a nudge, of which a graphic warning is one. It might be a nudge in the form of uh, ca campaigns that are educative and emotionally evocative to try to get people not to smoke. Uh, the behavioral interest in uh, cigarette taxes is connected with the behavioral sense that people are making a mistake. Now, as we go from information provision, let's say, to graphic warnings, to taxes, to more aggressive stuff, we're compromising agency more and more. I'm drawn to nudges as a line of defense. And they are liberal in the sense that they don't take agency away. So a GPS device is a nudge. And it's doubly agency protective. First, you get to say where you want to go. If you want to go to London, the GPS device won't say, sorry, you're going to uh, Cambridge. Um, and also, if you don't like the route suggested by the GPS device, you can ignore it. You probably take longer or get lost, but you have that freedom. And nudges typically allow people to 
decide their destination, and they allow people to reject the suggested route. And this is very liberal. So I like to think that Mill would have no problem with behaviorally informed nudges. And I would like Mill not to have a problem with behaviorally informed uh, subsidies and taxes, but I'm less sure of that. And mandates, so this is a lot of behavioral uh, informed policy for you. An energy efficiency mandate might be justified as a way of reducing externalities, pollution. But the energy efficiency mandates that we observe in Europe and North America are typically not defensible by reference to externalities. They're more aggressive than that. And the only way really to make sense of them on standard welfare grounds is that consumers are gaining because they're having fuel efficient cars or they're having refrigerators that don't cost them so much. Now, the liberal retort is let them choose that. Don't force them to buy an energy efficient car. If part of the reason for it is that they'll save money, let them choose that. And the behavioral response is they may have present bias or it may be that this feature of the product isn't sufficiently salient to them. And those are academic arguments, but governments have made them too. So that's a little bit about freedom and behavioral economics. I'm afraid we only have time for one more question, but um, if you're free afterwards, press the great, we're happy to hang great. around in the bar and take great, some questions. Great. Fantastic. So one more question from our audience. We'll go to the member in the third row in the floral dress. Hi, thank you so much for your um, very poetic defense of liberalism. You are preaching to this chorister, at least. Um, my question is, um, I think regarding the thing which really attracts me to liberalism, which is its onus on tolerance, um, and what can be done to sort of rehabilitate tolerance? Because it's something which has been, I think, maligned slightly, where on one side of the aisle, it's almost become an empty mantra where it has its own language and behaviors and it's not really assimilated. It's something which is performed, maybe, or parroted. And then on the other side, tolerance becomes enforced and then it becomes authoritarian. And then suddenly you have a lot of people talking about being silenced very loudly on many platforms because they clearly don't know the meaning of the word silence. But regardless, tolerance, I think at its best, and what I love about it is it's an invitation to compassion and understanding one another sincerely, but what do you think can be done to take liberalism back to its root and not to be conscripting a certain worldview? No, that's fantastic, thank you. And I, I won't have an adequate response. Um, let's go in stages. So I was talking about respect rather than tolerance, um, but I think that's not entirely right. So to show respect for people who have divergent conceptions of the good is a good thing, and to show respect for one's own divergent interests is also a good thing. And we might not say we'll tolerate people who like X and Y and Z, we respect them. But I think your question is, is signaling that that's not adequate, because there are some things we don't respect that we tolerate. They may be actions or views, and it, not to respect it, if I, we could devise an example where that would, be, that would be fair. I don't respect, and then you can finish the sentence, and that's honest, but you also say I tolerate it. Okay, then you're, you're suggesting um, to enforce tolerance is um, along one dimension illiberal, where you force people, what, not to complain about something that they honestly and in good faith think is terrible. Um, I'm thinking uh, the practical problem is harder to figure out than the conceptual. And uh, uh, you might think that in a diverse society that, um, there are people with divergent conceptions of the good, including some that are hateful or something 
to someone who shares a different, has a different conception of the good. And in a liberal society, the various ones are permissible so long as they don't. And then we have to finish the sentence. They don't result in bodily injury or result in safety risks, where safety is understood in an unreconstructed, uh, if you're with me, literal safety, not making people feel unsafe. And uh, it's hard to do this without thinking of particular cases, but to think, okay, during World War II, there was a judge with the improbable name Learned Hand. It's, that was really his name, Learned Hand. And uh, he must have been beaten up a lot, a lot as a kid, and so he became a very distinguished judge. And in World War II, he said, um, the spirit of liberty is that spirit which is not too sure that it is right. That's kind of perfect for what you're describing. Because he didn't say is not sure that it is right, but it's not too sure that it is right. Have a little voice in your head thinking, I might be wrong, or this is a fellow member of the human species and they probably think what they do for a reason. Then that can breed tolerance. I know, I know the, the question you're raising is related to at least some things happening on some American college campuses where people who have right of center views really are not tolerated. And in my view, that's horrible for 17 liberal reasons. And there are other reasons that aren't so liberal that are also good reasons, that it's terrible. And uh, to stand for a norm that it's in the collective interest. Each one of us can do that a little bit. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but one question that we ask all of our speakers at the end of their talks um, is, if you could offer a piece of advice to the members of the Oxford Union um, and the members of the University of Oxford in two or three sentences, what would it be? Okay. Um, the best I ever heard, I'm just going to parrot here, which is that my co-author, Richard Thaler, a, um, got the Nobel for behavioral economics, um, gave a graduation speech, he had never told me this, where he described his own career. And when he was an economics graduate student, he was doing some standard economic stuff, and, and he was good at it. Not that good, but good. And he started doing the behavioral stuff. And his advisors all told him, this is terrible. Uh, you're not gonna have a career. It's nonsense. And don't do that terrible work. And he said he kept at it for two reasons. One was he wasn't that good at regular economics. <laughs> so he's not doing the regular one. It wasn't like he was gonna be a superstar. But second, and most important, he loved it. And he thought, even if things don't go well for me in my career or that well, I will have had a great time failing. And so the theme is that doing something you love is the best hedge, and that is the advice. So if you find something that you really like, keep doing it. And if you don't like it, don't keep at it for too long. Don't give up, but not too long. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Professor Kastansky.